Web services are a central part of modern software architecture. In the early days of the World Wide Web, web browsers living on client computers were designed to help users find internet resources. You might be reading a document, you'd see a link to another document, you'd click the link, and boom, the next article would appear. The early web was all about hypertext, the H in HTML. It's fun to use the Wayback Machine, a huge archive of past web content to look at some early web pages. For example, the first website in the United States was housed at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center in Palo Alto, California. You can see early versions of their website using the Wayback Machine by going to www.slac.stanford.edu. That will take you to a listing of all the different versions of the website that are available in the Wayback Machine. I'll start with the earliest version of this website that's available in the Wayback Machine archive. It's from 1996. I'll click on it, and that takes me to the archived website. This website was designed for scientists. You could go into any of the links, and from there jump from document to document to document. There wasn't much fancy about it, but it made information available at a blinding speed. Now compare that to the modern version of the same website at www.slack.stanford.edu. This version of the site uses modern div tags and cascading style sheets in JavaScript to give the user a much more modern experience. You can use the Wayback Machine on other favorite websites, for example, this is an early version of the lynda.com website. Notice the use of courier font and animated GIF graphics. The exploding popularity of the web eventually resulted in a huge amount of server-side and networking infrastructure becoming available, well, worldwide. And at the same time, a growing dissatisfaction with the page-by-page -page architecture of early websites led to the introduction of Web 2.0, a style of web design where the page stays in place in the browser and new information is retrieved in the background, eventually leading to updating the page's data and appearance. On the client, the web browser introduced a system known informally as AJAX, standing for asynchronous JavaScript and XML to retrieve data from a server without having to completely refresh the web page. And on the server, web services responded to web requests with data that was sent in forms not intended for direct human consumption. Modern web applications, such as web-based email clients like Google's Gmail, Microsoft's Outlook.com, or Yahoo Mail, all do this. But to avoid refreshing a page while getting new data, you need a way of communicating over the web that goes beyond visual content. And web services fit the bill. So what exactly is a web service? In its simplest form, a web service is a framework for a conversation between two computers. These computers are communicating over the web. A client sends a request over the internet, and a server receives that request processes it, and returns a response. When a browser makes a request for a web page, it receives HTML and other related content in the response. But when it just asks for data and uses JavaScript or other client-side code to process the response, a web service has been used. Web services typically have very strict requirements for usage that are documented for developers. Modern web service communications are nearly always handled over HTTP, that's Hypertext Transfer Protocol, but the format of the messages that are being sent and received can differ greatly. If you're a software developer and you want to use a web service, you'll need to know the Application Programming Interface, or API, for that service. Here are some of the critical things you need to know. First, what's the message format? Some web services use SOAP a particular XML format, others use generic XML markup, and still others use JSON, an acronym for JavaScript Object Notation. And how do you form a request? 
Said differently, what is the required syntax of the service requests? Do you make requests with named methods using syntax that's similar to client-side programming? Or do you use uniform resource identifiers or URIs that are sent as HTTP requests? What are the names, data types, and potential values of parameters that you send in as part of the request? Other things that you'll learn from the API documentation include are actions on the web service associated with HTTP verbs, such as get, post, put, and delete? Is the web service secured? And if so, what do you need for authentication? Are a simple username and password sufficient? Or does some sort of security token get passed back and forth? And when data is returned from the web service, what form will it be in? Will it be in XML, JSON, or some other format? Are there particular field names and data types that you need to know about? And are you always getting back all of the data, or is there some sort of data paging mechanism? All of these taken together are the Web Services API. For developers, the idea of an API is commonplace, whether it's a client-side library for a particular language, such as Java, Ruby, or Python, or a description of how to perform actions on and get data from a remote server. An API and its associated documentation are critical to the developer's success. As you'll see throughout this course, you can only use web services if you know how to speak their language. And finally, there's a big difference between knowing how to talk to a web service and knowing how it's working in the server environment. When you send a request to the web service, you'll need to know whether to use SOAP or JSON, HTTP put or get requests, and so on. But you usually don't need to know what programming language, database, or other technologies are being used in the server environment. A web service hides its complexity behind the wall of the web. It doesn't matter whether the web service is managed by PHP, ASP.NET, or Node.js. As long as you send the request in the right format and get back the expected responses, you'll be able to call the web service from your client-side application. And if you're building web services, you shouldn't have to care what sort of clients are sending the requests. They could be coming from desktop, web, mobile, or embedded applications. They could be running on a computer, a phone, a tablet, or an internet-connected refrigerator. And of course, they can be coded in any supported programming language. As long as they ask their questions correctly, your web service should be able to send back the expected responses. Web services are therefore the great decouplers of modern computing. The client doesn't understand how the server works and vice versa. Each does what it does well, and they work together through a shared vocabulary.